Hey y'all, let's play a game. It's called Images You Can Hear. I'm going to show you four pictures, see if you can guess the common theme. If you didn't pick up on what I was throwing down there, I found Mahotsukai Prikyua to be a uh, letdown. This was not a bad season by any means, in fact, it had a really strong main cast, which is usually the most important element. Hell, if that was the only metric I was judging this by, this season would be one of my favorites. Alas, my viewing was plagued with an undercurrent of disappointment because this season set up an intriguing world that it proceeded to do far too little with. In other words, this season set up expectations that it never even came close to fulfilling. Most of the time I watched this season was spent wishing it was something more, wishing it lived up to the excitement and intrigue built in the first several episodes, and maybe that's a personal failure. Maybe I failed to truly engage with this season by wishing it was something it wasn't, but I can't help but feel that these feelings are justified by how the show presented itself. And whether or not that's true, whether I should have felt that way or not, nothing can change the fact that my viewing experience, and thus my further thoughts, opinions, and interpretations were all caked in disappointment. And I hate that because I don't want to linger on negative or depressing thoughts. I don't want that to be my, my brand. brand. I try to make videos about subjects that intrigue me. I don't want to harp on thing bad. I want to present my perspective and hopefully spark in you, dear viewer, interest in what I'm discussing, maybe draw out your interpretations or further discussion. The last thing I want to do is linger on the same point of, well, this is disappointing, but I guess that's what I inadvertently signed up for when I decided to sit through and make vaguely analytical videos about every iteration of a single media property. So, for the sake of my sanity, I'll try to make this relatively quick. I'm going to lend this season as much credit as I can possibly manage, and when I can't do that, I'll try to speak on why exactly this season disappointed me, so... Alright, let's get to it. <laughs> We're going to start on a positive note by discussing the only element this season managed to hit home, its main cast. This season managed to endear me to its main duo, Mirai and Liko, very fast. Each are believable and relatable as individual characters, and their relationship has a singular level of depth and emotional complexity that I dare say outstrips that of any prior one-on-one -on -one relationship in this franchise. And then Kotoha comes into her own and reshapes the group dynamic and is herself just oodles of fun. So yeah, there's some good shit there. First off, let's examine this season's caffeine-personified protagonist, Mirai Asahina. Though I suppose that description also holds true for Kotoha. Like mother, like daughter, I suppose though. I'm getting ahead of myself. There's lots to like about the energetic Mirai. There's her spirit of adventure, her loyal nature, her open-mindedness, among many other things. Functionally, she's a very active agent in the story, always driving events forward, and she's endearing because she always does so with a smile on her face. Let's not forget that the entire show only happened because Mirai decided almost on a whim that she wanted to meet a magician, so she went out and found one and then hugged it until it soul bonded with her. When Mirai wants to do something, you can bet your ass it's gonna get done, and I'm just like, you go girl. Mirai's adventurous spirit is what drives forward much of the overarching narrative and a lot of the episodic stories in between. Like many isekai protagonists, Mirai often functions as a sort of viewer surrogate. Just as she knows little and is learning about this new world, so too are we alongside her. Her enthusiasm for that learning is what keeps us excited about this world, about exploring and learning about it. And that very enthusiasm keeps us curious, yearning for more, drawing us back week after week for a time. 
at least. In terms of that enthusiasm and, well, everything else, it would be fair to say that Mirai Asahina isn't much of a departure from previous Precure Pro tags. What sets her apart for me is not her personality or that she's the first to really explore a new world in this series. Rather, it's the actions she takes, both while exploring that world and living her life. Actions that show her to be a noble spirit. What stands out most to me about her is that she acts as a sort of unifier between the worlds. Mirai has feet planted firmly in both worlds, having lived in the non-magic world most of her life and having attended magic school and made friends there. Episode 16 sees these two worlds collide. While Mirai and Liko are staying in Mirai's hometown, their magician friends come to visit them and their non-magic friends, and the rest of the day is spent with the magic and magicless hanging out in harmony, with Mirai being the common factor that unites them. Thus, Mirai ends up being a sort of figurehead for multicultural unity. Despite being from different worlds and different cultures, these girls, previously total strangers, were able to hang out and make friends with each other over just one commonality. It's a heartwarming message of unity, showing that no matter our differences, we can all learn how to get along through even just the smallest of similarities. That, along with her loyalty and dedication to her friends, makes Mirai a lovable hero in my eyes. Speaking of... Next, we've got Mirai's air quotes friend, Liko. I love this girl because she's a little bit full of herself. She'll do that thing where she screws something up and is all like, actually, I meant to do that. On top of being comedic, that sort of behavior is telling of not just what she thinks of herself, but also and especially of the high expectations she's placed on herself. She's a girl who's dedicated to her passion to such a degree that she cannot let any weakness show, and it takes a real special someone to get her to open up. Liko is overburdened by expectations. Expectations that she mostly placed on herself based on the environment she grew up in. From the start, Liko isn't shy about letting everyone know that her goal is to be the very best magician like no one ever was. No one forced that goal on her. She simply looked at the accomplishments of her family, those of her archaeologist father, dedicated mother, and talented sister, and decided that she had to live up to those very high standards. Chasing that dream gave her a sense of purpose. She wants to belong to and make proud her family, a family that she doesn't realize would be proud of her regardless. So when she puts her all into becoming a talented magician, she could never bring herself to admit that she actually kind of sucks at it. Imagine how devastating that must feel, to be so focused on one goal, only for that one goal to seem impossibly out of reach. To put it lightly, that has to hurt. It certainly hurt Liko, turning her into something of a self-obsessed introvert who has to lie to herself to stay sane. No, I can't possibly be bad at magic, she tells herself. I didn't screw up, I just... Uh... And then she makes up some excuse or distracts herself in order to avoid having to confront her own shortcomings. Like, maybe she'll get distracted by a lost teddy bear, for instance. Meeting Mirai was the best thing that happened to Liko because it allowed her to open up about her problems to someone else and thus confront them herself. You never have to go it alone. Sometimes in life you're going to face obstacles that are completely insurmountable if you're by yourself. Liko, in pursuit of greatness, had isolated herself, pretending that she didn't need any help in honing a skill as complex as sorcery. But after she befriended Mirai, that attitude started to change. Once trust had developed between the two, it was only a matter of time before she was able to open up about her struggles, the things she never would have done if she were still on her own. And once she'd done that, it was just another small step to allow herself to receive help from Mirai, from her sister, from anywhere, really. All Liko had to learn was that it's okay to ask for help. You can achieve a great many things in life, all the more so if you reach out for help when you need it. And I suppose that's as good a segue as any into a quick, more general discussion of the relationship between Mirai and Liko, because holy shit, these two be gay for each other. Not that they ever say so out loud, which is kind of damning to my argument, uh, but still, with all the proclamations these two make about being at each other's sides forever and ever, it's only a matter of time. These two are dedicated to each other to a ridiculous degree. These two are so inseparable that on two separate occasions, one 
of them makes a choice to uproot their whole life to follow the other into a whole other world and stay there for an extended period of time. That's not something you do for someone you just barely know or just kind of like. Even good friends would hesitate to make that decision, but those two had no qualms about their decisions. When these two say they want to be together forever and ever, I wholeheartedly believe it. I wanted to bring this up just because I think it's nice to see Precure portray that sort of relationship, one in which two people are totally dedicated to one another. Mirai and Liko will be together through hell and high water. They'll help each other through any crisis. Dare I say, their love seems almost unconditional. It warms my soul is what it does. The human experience is often unfortunately plagued by tough times, hardships that eat at our soul. And often the best remedy for those bad times is just having someone be there for you. Someone who can cheer you up when you're feeling down. Someone to help you when you're struggling. That and more are what Mirai and Liko are for each other. And if that holds forever, then baby, that's love. Oh, and there's the fact that they have a daughter. They say as much out loud. They are moms, and they have a daughter. You know, that daughter's pretty nice, too. Kotoha is a fairy who eventually grows into a real girl, which, weird but okay, and a whole bunch of other plot shit, but whatever. Kotoha is just endless fun. I don't have much to say about her, other than her frequent magic antics usually put a smile on my face. Like her escalating series of magic misadventures during the beach episode, culminating in a simple but effective lesson about the need to be mindful of others and your surroundings, or how about that time when she did a soccer and then T-posed on a soccer ball? Oh my god! So yeah, that's the main cast. I do love them. Mirai the adventurous, Liko the dedicated, and Koltoha the caffeinated, are all very huggable, and their family dynamic breathes life into my soul. Unfortunately, that all constitutes the bulk of what I enjoyed about this season. With all that said, let's talk about my disappointment. These unwelcome feelings of mine stem from one element, the season's lackluster world building. It felt like this season was unable to stick to its initial premise. It felt like the first few episodes made a promise that the rest of the season broke it. <sighs> Let's back up and see if I can't illustrate this by using another well-known magic story for kids as an example. This might seem like too obvious a parallel to draw, but fuck you, I'm doing it anyway. You don't need me to explain the Harry Potter to you, do you? Not many media properties can be said to be culturally ubiquitous, hell actually none can, but Harry Potter is, I think just about the closest thing too. Alongside, of course, Star Wars and the hit 1976 film Robin and Marion, starring Sean Connery and Audrey Hepburn. If there are only three media properties out there that are known by almost everyone, it's definitely those three in equal measure. <laughs> what the fuck just happened? What the fuck? Did Sean Connery just punch Audrey Hepburn in the face? Oh, look at that guy. He's so he's so amused that he just saw that happen. Sean Connery punched Audrey Hepburn in the face. Fuck! <laughs> anyway, point is, you know what Harry Potter is, and if you don't... What's wrong with you? Go watch the movies or read a synopsis. Now, assuming that we're all on the same page, let's take a moment to imagine an alternate Harry Potter storyline. In this theoretical alternative, Harry's first year at Hogwarts plays out mostly the same, but at the end of it, Harry decides that, yeah, that was fun and all, but man, he sure misses the Muggle world and the Dursleys, so for the next year, he doesn't return to Hogwarts and instead goes to boring old non-magic school, and he does that for the rest of his youth. Oh, and he takes Ron with him, I guess. Maybe every once in a while, a Death Eater shows up, Maybe Harry and Ron pop into Hogwarts for a visit every holiday or something, and during Harry's last year at school, Voldy just shows up and he somehow deals with his gray ass, but for the most part, the rest of the series is just Harry and Ron goofing off at Muggle School. And maybe that theoretical alternate series would in and of itself be fine, but even just thinking about it, you know, something's missing. Right, something crucial, some unique element that brings the whole world and story to life. I love magic. Exactly. The whole time watching this theoretical alternative, you'd just be left wondering, But what about the fucking magic school, Harry? Now, just substitute Harry Potter 
for Mirai Asahina, and that's exactly how I felt watching Maho Tsukai Precure. And I'll explain further in a bit, but before that and before you hop in the comments, yes, I realize that was an imperfect metaphor. The life situations of Harry Potter and Mirai Asahina are different enough such that it makes sense in their respective stories for Harry to try to get away and stay away from the muggle world, and for Mirai to not have any antipathy towards either. But the point here is not to make a one-to-one -one comparison between the stories. The point here is just to illustrate my feelings through an easily understood example. Beat off the table! Beat off the table! No, it wouldn't make sense for Harry to leave behind the magic world, but if he did that, if his story was one of him living away from that life after being exposed to it, wouldn't that just be terribly dull? So how does Mahotsukai Precure spark this dullness, this disappointment? To my eyes, this season fails to follow through on its premise. It sets up a cool world and fails to use it. And to be clear, this is not a problem that rears its head immediately. Oh no, this is not a happiness charge situation where everything's just sort of dull from the start with occasional sparks of life throughout. The first nine episodes of Mahotsukai Precure are actually really good. They're pretty much the Philosopher's Stone. They effectively establish the main cast, the side characters, and the setting. Not only a magic school, but a whole new magic world that it's a part of. Those precious few episodes see the characters attending classes and visiting a handful of magic locales, each providing effective world and character building while also leaving open numerous possibilities for further exploring this world and the magic therein. For a while there, it was exciting just seeing where a new episode would take us, what new part of the world the characters would explore, what new magical thing they would learn about in class and experiment with. And then, at the end of episode 9, that excitement died, the creativity waned, things got dull. After that, Mirai returned to the boring ass non-magic world with Liko, and then they just attended normal school for the bulk of the rest of the time. Harry abandoned Hogwarts. The magic died. This one choice, this one direction in the story, tainted the whole rest of the season for me. It felt like my soul was given a direct injection of sad. This season's insistence on spending all that time in the non-magic world, and in particular the boring-ass normal school, limited its storytelling possibilities. No longer can we spend an episode exploring a new world and meeting new creatures and people. No longer can we hang out at the magic school and learn new magic with our cool magic friends, instead we're going to, uh, study math. <sighs> Nothing new under the sun here. This is territory Precure has explored before, and will doubtless explore again. And there's nothing inherently wrong with retreading a well-worn path. The problem here is that this season started down a different path before backtracking, and deciding to again walk the well-worn one after all. That hurts because it feels like a betrayal. The magic was new and exciting. The time spent in the regular world was comparatively mundane. It felt like the season had its uniqueness beaten out of it until it was much more normal and, dare I say, safe. I'm disappointed in this season because it failed to utilize its setting, that magic world, to even half its potential. In other words, most of the time I was watching Maho Tsukai Precure, I couldn't help but wonder, but what about the fucking magic school, Harry? And that's the main thrust of my disappointment, but while we're here, we might as well talk about what was there, the elements of this world that this season did let slip before retreating to mundanity. On the one hand, I want to say I appreciate what's there. Like I said earlier, I was really into those first nine episodes where there was some focus on world building. I loved that we could just take an episode to visit the mermaids, learn about their people and their history, and, of course, learn some life lessons along the way. But again, after episode 9, all the world building just sort of stops. No, the show says, you've already seen all there is to see. There definitely isn't any more to this magic world to explore. Now please attend a class like a good child. Thus, the world is left feeling incomplete. It's not that I need to see every inch of this world in order to believe it. It's more like because this season adamantly refuses to explore any more of it, I couldn't help but get the sense that that was it. Leaving that new world feeling small, hollow, empty. The refusal of this season to explore any 
any more of that world felt like it betrayed a lack of creativity, which is just depressing. It gives us few elements, and what few elements are there are just there at best. Hell, at worst, the revisiting of those few elements over the course of the season just amplifies that feeling that this world is emptier than it should be. Like, this season made a big deal out of these foods called frozen clementines, right? The season introduces them early on as a way of demonstrating Liko's struggles with practical magic, which is fine storytelling, by the way. But then, almost every time they revisit the magic world, so too do they revisit frozen clementines again and again and again? It seems to be the only food they consume while over there, so I can't help but wonder, is this, like, the only food that exists in Maho Tsukai's magic world? Hyperbole, of course. I'm sure something else exists, but if it does, this season never brought it into focus enough for it to stick. Prime example, one thing they eat on screen only once is cotton candy. It's just cotton candy. It's just cotton candy, but it floats. It, it, uh. This season's singular focus on that one food hurts the credibility of the world it tries to build. If you want me to believe in your fictional world as a functional and self-sustaining one, and you want to establish that it uses fictional food on top of that, I'm going to need to see the people eating, you know, more than one kind of food. Like, let's look back at Harry Potter again. Can you name more than one fictional food that was established as a part of that magic world? I can. Bernie bots every flavor beans and those sentient jumping frog things. See, that is precisely one more fictional food than in Maho Tsukai, but just that one extra shows that the author, Hatsune Miku, put 100% more effort into conceptualizing just the candy consumed in this magic world than Maho Tsukai did into the whole of its world. I realize I sound like I'm getting hung up on a minor detail here, but the point isn't that they only had one food, therefore bad. The point is that this one detail, or lack thereof, is emblematic of the season's inability to explore and flesh out its world to a believable degree. It's... It's disappointingly shallow, is what it is. And one last gripe about the story direction, it kind of ruins Liko. At least her character arc is rendered a tad nonsensical. Like we discussed earlier, her goal is to study magic and be the best damn magician around. She struggles to actually perform magic, despite being book smart, so you'd think the logical course of action for her would be to practice and overcome her weakness, right? If you got something you're not good at, but you want to be good at it, the natural course of action is to practice that thing until you are good at it. Except... Well, I guess not, because Liko here just doesn't do that. Once Liko goes to the non-magic world, she is explicitly forbidden from casting or practicing magic so that the existence of the magic world is kept secret. So, let me get this straight. Liko, you're going to become the best magician around by not attending the magic school and by not practicing magic, the thing you are bad at. A little counterintuitive, no? It's like trying to learn piano by practicing baseball. There's not exactly a whole lot of practical overlaps between those two fields now, are there? And a young! How about back to... Alright, I think I've been harping on this one thing for long enough, but before I move on, I just want to ask one thing. Is this disappointment of mine actually my fault. I can't help but wonder whether I was the one letting myself down by bringing in all sorts of expectations based on the premise established by the first few episodes. Expectations which this season had absolutely no need or requirement to follow. Like, I've seen my Harry Potters and my Little Witch Academias, and maybe that colored my idea of what this season should have been. Like, maybe the signs were there from the start about what the season aimed to accomplish, and my quickly formed expectations blinded me to that reality. Maybe this season Season did nothing wrong, and my disappointment is all on me for wanting this season to be something it never really tried to be. That doesn't change the fact that the disappointment I felt was very real, but still, now that I've seen the show and I know where it goes, perhaps I wouldn't be so disappointed on a rewatch. Perhaps this season is one of few that could actually really benefit from a rewatch. Who knows? I don't, because I ain't gonna. What, you think I have time to rewatch 50 episodes of a TV series I didn't care for much in the first place? Come on, people, I've got a life to live, believe it or not. I ain't got time for that. 
Okay, so now we've spent far too long drenched in negativity. Let's try digging through this season for some uplifting talking points. Feet off the table! Feet off the table! First off, how about that teddy bear, huh? Uh, okay, well, to be honest, I don't care much for the teddy bear as a character. At best, Mofudun is usually just there and only occasionally descends into being mildly irritating. So overall, he's a pretty neutral presence on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. I do, however, dig what he represents hanging on to childhood. Unlike most small magic sidekicks throughout Pre-Cure, Mofurun was actually a part of the main character's life long before the events of the season started. Whereas the regular fairies are beings that come into the girls' lives, either alongside or to deliver the season's magical powers, thus themselves representing change in those girls' lives, budding maturity and all that, Mofurun is a vestige of the past. He was a friend to Mirai since childhood. Inanimate, though he may have been, he's a constant reminder of Mirai's childhood, and throughout the season, even after she ages into adulthood in the last episode, she never lets go of him. She keeps her childhood with her, even as she matures. This reminds me of that old C.S. Lewis quote, When I became a man, I put away childish things, including the fear of childishness and the desire to be very grown up. And this is Mirai's surprising wisdom, that there's real value in her youthful optimism and excitement, that she doesn't have to forcibly reinvent herself to fit with widely accepted notions of adulthood. Mirai is comfortable embracing childish things because that's who she is, that's what she enjoys, and that makes her more mature than anyone. Okay, so that was that thing. What else? Other good miscellaneous points. Oh, uh, so there's this one teacher in the magic school who's pretty authoritative, and in episode 41, she's out patrolling the halls when the good children should be sleeping, and uh, this happens. And when that happened, I was like, wait a minute, I'm getting some trigger flashbacks here. Uh, what else? Other good points. Oh, uh, uh, this season's crossover movie was actually good. It was a musical this time, which was a different. I, I liked this, the second number. That was boppin'. God, I'm having to go to the inconsequential movies to find praise. That's not a good sign. And, uh, no, that that's pretty much it. Yeah, I think my judgment for the season's pretty clouded. I can't think of much else to wax poetic about, yet there are still a few completely random, almost meaningless things that I feel compelled to bitch about. So strap in, we've got one more segment in this video to power through. Whimsical background track. Uh... I promise I'll make this quick. I've just got uh, six last points I want to hit on. Birthday, Cinderella, dental hygiene, toddlers, the villains, and episode 50. Okay? Okay, one at a time then. First up, birthday. So not only does the season as a whole backtrack from its initial premise into something less challenging, but so too do individual episodes. The best example of this is episode 40, the one about Liko's birthday. This episode starts with Liko's whole family suddenly showing up on the Asahina family doorstep to celebrate. Liko is flustered and annoyed, and continues to be so throughout the rest of the episode. She's clearly perturbed when her mother insists on reading her a story, with the reasoning that it was always her favorite as a child, and the only moment she seems happy is when her sister Liz pulls her aside and gives her a small, thoughtful gift that Liko actually likes. It's not hard to see what's implied here. In the time the family's been apart, Liko has significantly grown. Her likes and preferences how her very being has evolved. As we discussed earlier, part of her reason for wanting to become a witch was to make her family proud, and by this point, she hopes to have at least gotten part of the way there. Except when mom and dad show up, she's not given the chance to show off any of that. Instead, they dominate the day, forcing upon her their expectations for what she should want and ideas about how her birthday should go. They treat her like a child, give her no say in her day. Conscious of it or not, her parents break a bunch of her boundaries, all of which reads to me as set up for a family heart-to-heart -heart about mutual respect. Except nope! I guess that was too nuanced a lesson to commit to, because at the end, Liko is pretty much put in her place and told to always love her parents. 
parents are always right no matter what, your feelings don't matter, just listen to them. <sighs> the ending of the episode reframes the whole affair so that Liko was being the unfair one, while the parents were just being nice when clearly the opposite was true. The episode couldn't commit to the nuanced lessons, so the ending backpedals and communicates a message that's naive at best and harmful at worst. And that's just nasty. Second point, Cinderella. Remember how in Smile Precure they had an episode where the girls got trapped in Cinderella and it got gay and it was pretty great? Well, I guess that was an idea so nice they had to do it twice because this season has yet another episode where the Precure girls just do Cinderella. Except this time, instead of being fun, it's just a vehicle for introducing another plastic toy. Woo. And w wait a minute, that toy- w Come on, that's just a Stargate with glitter. That toy's just a bloody Stargate. And the Magic MacGuffins in the second half of the season are just there to activate the Chevrons. What do you suppose happens when they activate them all? <laughs> I, I really appreciate the five of you viewers who understood any of that. If you didn't, here's the one lesson I want you and everyone else to take from this video. Please watch Stargate SG-1 and Atlantis. Those are like two of my favorite shows ever. They're great, I promise. Better than Mahout Sky, at least. A uh, third point, dental hygiene. So episode 38 almost hits on a unique idea before devolving into a meme. The episode is about a Halloween adjacent tradition in the magic world where all the witches and wizards chase around this big pumpkin in hope of getting a wish granted. So they do that for a while, but soon they realize that something seems off. Of all things, they have to get scolded by the villain of the episode to realize what's wrong. In blindly following the tradition, they failed to take into account how the pumpkin felt about it. It seemed pretty distressed when being chased, indicating that this tradition was a source of stress and anxiety for it. This could have been a lesson in blindly following traditions, how doing so without due consideration can lead to unforeseen consequences, such as hurting others. Don't blindly follow a tradition just because everyone else does. Instead, pause to consider the tradition and its consequences for the people around you, and determine for yourself whether that tradition is really worth following. <sighs> Except nope! It turns out at the very end that the chase didn't bother the pumpkin at all. It liked it, and all that was bothering it was a fucking cavity. Brush your teeth, kids! This episode discarded a potentially important lesson about thoughtfulness and consideration of others in favor of reminding kids to brush their fucking teeth! Fuck! Ah, I'm too upset, I'm ruining my brand! Ugh, okay. I'm sorry. Calming down. Moving on to the fourth point. Uh, toddlers. So, uh, remember in Smile Precure, again, where there was an episode where the main cast just turned into toddlers, and that was probably the worst episode of the season. Well, guess what? I wonder why the season keeps lifting story ideas from Smile. No deep observations, just weird. Uh, fifth, the villains. Uh, I'm only bringing this up because if I don't, someone will definitely ask. So the villains in this season exist. That's it. That's my opinion. Uh, finally, episode 50. This episode should not exist. First off, episode 49 was the perfect send-off for the season. That episode I actually really enjoyed. After defeating the big bad, the rest of the episode is a melancholic epilogue following an adult Mirai reflecting on things and eventually tearfully reuniting with her family. It's as neat a closing as you can get, leaving little room for any additional story. It's telling, then, that absolutely nothing of substance occurs in episode 50. All that happens happens is that the main cast, now adults, turn back into kids for some reason. I would have been a lot less annoyed with this episode if we got to spend time with them as adults, mostly unexplored territory for Precure, but whatever. And meet the main character of the next season. That's it. Useless to the overall season, and just 
confusing in terms of franchise building. Like, this episode establishes that the Maho Tsukai girls are adults by the time the main girl of the next season starts at being a pre-cure. So how's the timeline going to match up with future crossover movies? On the one hand, that detail doesn't fucking matter at all, and I never thought about the timeline with previous crossover movies because it doesn't fucking matter, but on the other hand, this episode pretty much forced me to think about it by explicitly making it a part of the narrative that these girls are canonically much older than the Kira Kira girl, and I never wanted to think about this, but thanks to this episode, now I am, and man, fuck this episode. It just leaves a bad taste in my mouth, closing this season on a meandering last outing that didn't need to exist and only peddles useless, confusing franchise building. It it makes me feel icky, and I don't like it. Alright, that that's enough. Oh, this video wasn't fun to write. I don't like being this negative. I don't, I really don't, but this season had so many more things that irked me than things that tickled my fancy. I want to reiterate that there were things I really enjoyed. I loved the main cast. The definitely gay dynamic between Mira and Liko was heartwarming as fuck, and Kotoha was an endlessly fun and endearing presence, but then there's everything else about this season. It's failure to follow through on its premise and a whole bunch of little things besides. Taken as a whole, this was probably the most disappointing season of Precure. It's definitely not the worst, but I cannot see myself revisiting it anytime soon. Thanks for sitting through my rambling about a children's magical cartoon show. Given all of them takes I threw out in this video, I expect plenty more from you lot in the comments, so bring them on. Uh, the next video, due in March, will be a viewer's choice video on Princess Tutu, so make sure to stick around for that. Until then, don't forget, be gay, do crimes.